hours mostly affecting the north, turning a bit cooler as well. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, after falling at the last hurdle, Penny Mordaunt has tonight backed Liz Truss to become the next PM. And no wonder when she's promising this kind of strong and sensible leadership. Can I just ask you if you would ever authorise another lockdown? No. No. Hallelujah, that's what I've been waiting for. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak has announced more desperate and toothless policies like income tax cuts, but not for seven years' time. So is his latest taxation pledge just too little too late? I'll get your verdict in the clash at 9.25. Plus, Conservative commentator Alex Dean, assistant comment editor at The Daily Telegraph, Olivia Utley, and former Conservative MP Jerry Hayes will battle it out. Should we start fining patients for missing NHS appointments? That's another brainchild of Rishi, but what do my superstar panel make of it? I'll debate with Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and former MEP and father of the outgoing PM Stanley Johnson. That's at 10.30. Speaking of which, despite his resignation, the anti-Boris plotting still isn't over, with the Privileges Committee now trying to finish him off once and for all. When will this witch hunt end? I take a stand against this most heinous of political stitch-ups in my digest next. It's official, thanks to the brilliant Lionesses, football has finally come home, but with the high hypocritical left uh, still struggling to define what a woman is and whether a woman can have a penis, will this Euro success be enough to finally protect women's sport? We'll debate at 10. After her whistleblowing no doubt helped bring down the controversial Tavistock Centre, detransitioned activist Kara Bell hopes her traumatic ordeal at the Gender Ideology Clinic will not be in vain. She's uncancelled and stepping up her campaign to prevent the, quote, further medicalisation of children at 10.40. Two months ago, a devastating stroke destroyed his jubilee dream. Now, Meghan's father, Thomas Markle, delivers his first message to the British public as his son, Thomas Markle Jr., updates us on his father's health and weighs in on all the latest Sussex scandals. That exclusive coming up at 10.15. By the BBC. So desperate to tear down the Commonwealth Games with their incessant virtue signalling this year's event. Well, it's now dubbed the Common Woke Games by Spiked Online's brilliant Brendan O'Neill for good reason. He joins me to explain all at 9.40. 
What is behind this mad push? Have you noticed it to get us eating bugs? Well, a state of fear author Laura Dodsworth is crawling with rage over the net zero extremists and the privileged elite waging war on meat. She's tonight's outsider at 9.50. And how did we get to this, folks? The country's police force are arresting people for, wait for it, being anti-woke. Because someone has been caused, obviously, anxiety based upon your social media page. That's not why you've been arrested. Darren, I've got the Expect hot takes are plenty and a first look at tomorrow's newspapers and the media buzz throughout the 10 hour. And as ever, I'll crown a new Gracious Britain and uni and jackass at 10.50. This is Dan Wilson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing first, though. The Lionesses. Well, ladies, you did it. Wasn't it brilliant to see these sportswomen truly enjoy the moment with none of the PR misery or bad behaviour of their male equivalents. Uh, I think this moment proved that the most. Infectious, but uh, there is a serious point to the Lioness's victory. Why did all those politicians like Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak suddenly realise, suddenly realise last night what a woman actually is, a biological definition, which is essential if we want women's sport to survive? Well, we're going to tackle that important debate later in the Media Buzz with my superstar panel. Tonight, I'm joined by the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, star reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth, and conservationist and former MEP, Stanley Johnson. Busy show ahead. First, though, the news with Wally Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. Good evening. As you've been hearing, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are answering questions at the Conservative leadership hustings in Exeter this evening, with both candidates vying support from Tory party members. Candidate Liz Truss acknowledged what she called the difficult times facing the country, saying, now we have to be bold. And earlier, the Foreign Secretary made further policy announcements in her campaign to be Prime Minister, vowing to tackle post-Brexit restrictions to improve British farming. What I want to do is cut the red tape that farmers face, get rid of things like solar panels in our fields and instead be using it for productive agriculture and also make sure that farmers do have the seasonal workers that they need to help get the crops out of the ground. I know the struggles farmers face and I want to tell them that I'm on their side. We know how important food security is and I'll help deliver that. Meanwhile, the other leadership candidate, Rishi Sunak, has set out his vision for the economy, saying his plan is one of the most far-reaching initiatives to cut income tax people have seen. The former Chancellor has committed to taking four pence off income tax within seven years if he becomes Prime Minister, cutting the basic rate from 20 pence in the pound to 16. Now that bills are going to be higher than we thought, it's right that we go further. And as Prime Minister, what I want to do is cut VAT on energy bills to provide a little bit of extra help for people over the autumn and winter. But today I've been setting out my radical vision for where I want to take the economy after we get inflation under control. I want to cut income tax by 20%. That's one of the most far-reaching cuts to income tax that we've seen. Well, in news away from politics... Archie Battersby's mother says she feels her son has been let down by Britain's health care system. That's after the Court of Appeal ruled that the Royal London Hospital must switch off the 12-year-old's life support treatment at midday tomorrow. He's been in a coma since April. Court of Appeal judges have refused to allow an appeal against their decision, but Archie's parents say they'll now appeal to the Supreme Court directly. GB News has learnt the number of small boats arriving on the UK's shores has hit a record level, with the largest number of people crossing on a single day this year. 
More than 600 migrants are being processed by Kent today after the authorities seized around a dozen small boats over a 10-hour period. More than 3,500 people crossed the Channel in July in the highest monthly total this year. And as you've seen, the Lionesses' captain, Leah Williamson, has been celebrating and also says her team have changed the game of football, hopefully in this country and across the world. Those are the celebrations today in central London, Trafalgar Square to be precise, where thousands of fans gathered to celebrate the team's historic Euro 2022 win against Germany last night. It's England's first major football championship win since the 1966 World Cup. A record 87,000 people watching the Lionesses beat Germany at Wembley Stadium last night and 17.5 million people tuning in at home. Congratulations to them. You're up to date on TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News, where now it's time for Dan Wooden tonight. As Boris Johnson celebrated his wedding yesterday, the Westminster witch hunt to force him out of Parliament continued apace. But luckily, Boris hasn't lost his sense of humour or rhetorical flourish. During the speech at his wedding party, he described the coup to force him out of Downing Street less than three years after a landslide majority deliver Brexit as the greatest stitch-up since the Bayer Tapestry. But what's being plotted by the powerful Privileges Committee, led by Labour's Boris hater Harriet Harman, could become, could become an even greater stitch-up. That's because it's designed to finish off the political career of Boris Johnson once and for all by seeing him booted from Parliament altogether. Now, you won't have heard much about this plot, which is part of what's so disturbing. It's anti-democratic in nature. But in a nutshell, the committee chaired by Harmon has decided Boris could be found guilty of misleading the House of Commons even if he didn't deliberately or knowingly mislead the House when he said he thought no lockdown rules had been broken in Number 10 Downing Street. An HLE threat to free speech of our leaders. They now say intention is not necessary for a contempt to be committed. Now, Boris loyalist Michael Fabricant has told the Sunday Express this is a plan for a total stitch-up. When Parliament returns, I will be encouraging all MPs, particularly those with knowledge of our legal system, to oppose the Privileges Committee. We need to make one hell of a stink about this. That's because if he's found guilty of contempt, Boris could be suspended from Parliament for 10 days, which allows just 10% of his constituents to secure a by-election via a signing of a petition under the Recall of MPs Act 2015. So it's very obvious to me what this is about. Boris has no intention of going off quietly into the sunset after the way he was deposed, believing in a comeback in the style of his hero Winston Churchill, who was dumped by voters after World War II. ...largely accomplished. For now. Uh, I want to thank everybody here and... ...hasta la vista, baby. Thank you. What's more, his closest political ally, the Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries, believes Boris will be back too. He could even return Churchill style to number 10 one day. Well, I believe that. It's not just me. There's a, a, I can assure you that my phone is full of messages from people saying he'll be back. One day, Boris Johnson will be back. I think, you know, people have buyer's remorse at the moment. I know MPs are seriously... And uh, party donors too. Certainly the party donors. And I know people are thinking, what have we done? Could he be back before the next election? Oh, I, I, I'm not going to speculate on when or how, but I don't think it's the end. He's gone now. Now, speaking of Dean, uh, she actually doubled down over the weekend on her attacks on Johnson's political assassin, Fishy Rishi Sunak, even as she received criticism for posting this tweet. It was clearly uh, satirical, folks, so, so calm down. But in a damning column for the Mail on Sunday, she wrote, Rishi had been plotting against the most electorally successful prime minister the Conservative Party has known since the days of Margaret Thatcher. 
His actions made Michael Gove's portrayal of Boris Johnson during the 2016 leadership campaign appear like a rank amateur rehearsing for the role of Brutus in a village hall play. The coup which removed Boris Johnson was long planned, Tudor-esque in its degree of brutality and worthy of a chapter in a Hilary Mantel novel. But believe me, the plot isn't over. Harriet Harman will not rest until Boris is booted from Parliament, dashing his hopes of a comeback. So Tories must rise up against this increasingly anti-democratic madness where MPs believe they can subvert the voice of the people. To respond now, my superstar panel, Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, star reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and conservationist and former MEP Stanley Johnson. Carol Malone, what the Privileges Committee are proposing to do, I think, is a complete outrage. It, you know, it is, it is ludicrous that Harriet Harman, who is a former deputy leader of the Labour Party and who stood in as leader of the Labour Party very often, it is astonishing that she's being allowed to chair this committee. Are we seriously imagining that she will leave her politics and her prejudices at the door of the Privileged Committee meeting room? And, and then... And, you know, I don't believe it for a second. And I, and I think, you know, Boris is Labour's worst nightmare. You know, he, 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 was, he still... He did and still would garner more votes than most... Um, the, the, than Labour ever would. And, you know, there's a very... You know, you described before this process that they're trying to do now, this... this you've just got to have a... You've just got to think that... that you know, what, how did you describe it? You've just got to think... If you just think you've made a mistake, you're going to get mm. chucked out. Yep. There's an English principle in law, and it's called mens rea, which means guilty mind. And, and you have to show that you intended to yes. commit this crime. Yeah, so and, they, they say intention is not necessary for a contempt yes, and, to be Yes, and, and it, that, is against the, the, that is against the law. It's against the uh, principle of English law. So, and they're saying that they haven't changed the law, but clearly they have, because this... What's the, what's the phrase, this... Mis, this what is it, what's this misintention? Was never mentioned two or three months no. ago. Suddenly it's just come in yeah. to the public eye. But it, it just... It, it, I, and I know people will say, OK, on this committee there are four Tories and three Labour, but Harriet Harman is the chairman of that. She has more clout than anyone else on that committee and she will be able to sway what happens. And we know how many of the MPs uh, turn up. Now, yeah. Stanley, I guess we have to hold your hands up and say bit of a vested interest <laughs> on this subject. Well, i got to but say... it's a stitch-up, isn't it? Well, I, I have no inside knowledge. I want to, want to make this absolutely clear. But it does seem to me a bit of a stitch up. I'm very glad to, to, to hear Carol cite Michael, Michael Fabricant. I mean, particularly when he talks about mens rea, guilty of mind. In other words, you have to show that you intend mm. to commit a crime for a crime to be committed. And I think it is right. I think there are, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pack is being is being juggled in a in a uh, in, in possibly um, surreptitious way. In the old days, it was perfectly clear that the speaker would say, withdraw, if you, if you accuse someone of misleading the House. He said, withdraw. You can accuse them of inadvertently misleading the House. But what we're doing here is saying, well, whether it's advertent or not advertent, you know, you can, you can go down the drain. I think that is a very substantial... substantial well, it is when you change. add to it the recall and the fact oh, that, that only 10% of constituents have to demand a recall election. So you know there's going to be 10% of Labour activists who will do all they can to get the signatures and, needed. And what it would also <coughs> mean is that any MP who made a mistake in the House um, yeah. Yeah. could be chucked out, which of means course. you could have MPs being chucked out every other week. Probably. And, of course, it won't happen. This is only for Boris. This of course. is only a rule that's And that's the point, isn't it, Benjamin Butterworth? Special rules here to try and finish off Boris Johnson's political career. I presume you love it. I mean, heaven forbid that MPs should face consequences for not telling the truth to the public and to the House of Commons. But he says no, he did. I, I think these things but it's about are pretty good ideas. Whether he and well, sorry, Stanley, you come in. Well, I was just I didn't want to repeat an argument I had with Ben <laughs> before. And Ben, I hope you're not going to use these sorts of words again. Um, misleading, inadvertently misleading, is not the same as lying. Well, this is the, do you this accept is, that, Benjamin? Uh, well, I, I mean, I know what Stanley's saying. I think Stanley has a, a sympathy that most of the country doesn't no, share. That's simply not and, true, and, actually. And because, you know, the polling showed very clearly from January until the moment that he stepped down 
he offered his resignation, that the majority of the public, including the majority of Conservative voters, had lost trust in Boris Johnson and thought he should resign. And so, you know, the idea that this is some kind of stitch up from a committee, well, look, I highly but doubt... it is. I highly doubt this will get anywhere. But clearly, these rules apply to any MP, whether it's the outgoing Prime Minister or but Harriet Harman herself. Well, they've never applied in this way before. Never. Karen. And I this actually, is the do, first time I just, heard I, I, I actually really hope Benjamin's right that this gets nowhere. But yeah. unfortunately, Carol, I think they're going to go the full so way. With this. You know, I think they're going to suspend Boris. I think there will be a recall election, and then obviously the question is, you know, does he stand again, and does he get when, voted? When you back? know, if if, if Liz Truss gets elected, and I'm sure she will, she'll be out in two years' time because she is not a vote mm. winner. Boris is a vote winner. He 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 was, and he still would be. And Labour know that he was there biggest nightmare and and it's incredible the now Labour they Party now they've pushed it. oh the please hello Keir Starmer never stopped bringing stuff up stuff stuff was being leaked every Boris day Johnson and a lot no of us know who from Minister. Boris Johnson will no longer be the prime minister because conservative MPs including Steve Baker the arch brexiteer Pretty Patel, mean, the, who ordered him to go a day before he actually did. Those are the people that stopped Boris Johnson from being prime minister. Now you are. Are you seriously? Are you, are you clearly you're entitled what to disagree what, with that? But it was the Tory to talk, party's decision. Ben, we're not doing a general general attack otherwise on on on, on Boris. What we're trying to identify here is a substantial change which is being introduced mm -hmm. at yeah. committee level, which yeah. is of great political specifically for Boris. Yes. How can you justify well, that? Boris is the least truthful Prime Minister that this country has had. And, and I, I, you know, Stanley has an understandable sympathy to his How son. How can you say that? That's clearly I'm sorry, the case. Tony Blair yes. sent us into an illegal war and he's Look, still your hero. He likes. What you say well, is you a have disgrace. A problem with that, you might want to raise it with the Conservatives who voted in greater numbers than the Labour MPs at the time. Yeah, and I would but raise the, it with them you know, if you, any of them, you, if I, you, if you, any of them were here and they supported the Iraq war. But I'm sorry. You, Dan. To, you are genuinely saying... You are genuinely sitting here with a straight face saying that Boris Johnson misled the British public because he <coughs> didn't know about a particular illegal party that took place in Number 10, more than Tony Blair, who sexed up a dossier to take us into an illegal war. Well, You've lost the plot. Tony Blair continues to live rent free in your head 15 years after he left well, you, have just, an answer, I mean, you have an answer. You have an answer. You have an answer. Well, though. chance to be a fine thing. Well, you get know, on it with it. It shows how desperate you are that you have to hark back to a Prime Minister four PMs ago to try and just justify the one that's there right now. Look, you can sit there being as... No, you, you can sit there being Boris as, to other Prime you Ministers. Can sit there I've literally being given you a Prime Minister immediately you like. who you lied far more, with far more consequence, because it led to deaths of British troops. Yeah, well, you're desperately scraping the barrel. But the truth is <laughs> that you are hysterical because you can't accept that Boris Johnson for what he is, which the country saw. It is clear when there were so many parties, so many gatherings that were illegal, so many Can examples say, of it from on. in the garden... Can, Can you just say office, as well? You've had a lot to Johnson say now. Broke the you rules. have said the whole country was against Boris. No! Some of the Tory party were against Boris and all of the Labour yeah. party were against it. But the, the, we've heard since they've deposed him, we've heard the people who are in his support. And we'll, let's see what happens come the election because they will not... Liz Truss will not bring in the votes that Boris did. She and that's just won't. The but Stanley, party, Stanley made that the, the Tony Blair comparison is fair, isn't it? Because no-one even raised a single question uh, when, I, when he lied. And these, these so-called... Uh, oh. lies from Boris, a small fry compared well, to that. I'm glad you said so-called lies, because uh, I would maintain that position mm. absolutely, and you're perfectly right. Mr Blair got away with got away with blue murder. He really did. I mean, the, the, the dossier, the, you know, the cooked-up dossier, all, all that. I mean, it, it, it took place on his watch, and certainly he was never called to account in, in this sort of way. So, yes, I think we're seeing this as, as an arch political manoeuvre, which... I think it needs to be put firmly back in the drawer. Stanley, do you think that Boris Johnson broke the lockdown rules? No, I don't, personally. So you think that when he was seen in the garden with the wine and the cheese oh, or when he was on. collecting it in... Come well, the police the found he cake. didn't break the law yes. there, Benjamin. They didn't break the law, of course. Once. No, they didn't. Once. No, they didn't. It wasn't the, in the, the garden. Police, the police found that he, him and Rishi Sunak broke the law when Boris was unwittingly, by the way, he didn't even know, was presented with a yeah. birthday cake by his staff in the middle of the afternoon, yeah. which personally I think is the most ridiculous overreach it from did. the police, given yeah. that the, the Durham police thought it was completely fine for Keir Have Starmer for to down odd. beer after beer after beer and party with all take, of the people having a We take party. the view that any time a minister breaks the law, 
you know, he has to resign. What happens to all the people who drive 75, 80, 90 miles an hour? Yeah, because that's the, the level of... I can't quite believe you law. just said that with a straight face. What are you talking about? I'm the saying... people that make the laws shouldn't break the laws. That's the very basis uh, are you... of a civilised democracy like notice. the one we should... A fixed penalty notice, Benjamin, is the equivalent of a speed fine. So do you think and an MP should criminal. resign if they uh, go over the speed limit? We know full well, and, well, no, no, do, should, and do so you. do the millions of people in this no, country do you. who followed lockdown rules. Those people that you claim to care about, I who couldn't see their loved ones this. when they were banned I from going to hospitals you... or going to see friends and family when they dearly wanted it. The people you claim ben, to care for, they followed the rules. He was found to have broken the rules, have broken the rules once. He did not follow He was found to have broken the rules one time. And we know he broke it many more times. No, no well, you know that. So you know more than the police. When we see the pictures of him in the garden, sat with his wife, sat with his his, his, his home. don't work in Downing <laughs> yeah. Street, having cheap Ben, wine. I've got to tell you. That wasn't in okay, the Okay, final room. word to Stanley. You are the most tedious man I think I've ever heard. <laughs> you have come back time and time again to a whole lot of totally irrelevant Which arguments. the vast majority of the British public believe... No, you don't know what the vast majority of the British public believe. No, well, we do, think. because the polling no, you showed don't. it consistently. The polling showed, the polling showed it was 50-something they thought he should resign. It wasn't it was the majority 60%. of the British public. Sorry, I, I, you're fighting the last... It was not You're fighting 60. the last war, Ben. Well, I'm answering the question... Well. Well, uh, Dan is on about four prime ministers ago. He's still obsessed. I'm just laughing because I can just see Twitter <laughs> exploding. Yeah. The Stanley most tedious saying, man. The most tedious man. <laughs> well done, Stanley. <laughs> Benjamin, smile. Little joke. Oh, are you Little upset? Joke. Oh God, he's Little up. joke. Oh. Stanley Johnson, Benjamin Butterworth, Carol Malone. Adore you all, and we do it with good spirit and humour. Uh, coming up, have the Commonwealth Games become common woke games? Brendan O'Neill breaks down how one of the world's greatest sporting events has become a platform for self-flagellation. He joins me at 9.40. But up next in the clash is Fishy Rishi Sunak's 2029 tax cut pledge too little too late. My lineup of political masterminds, Conservative commentator Alex Dean, assistant common editor at the Daily Telegraph, Olivia Utley, and former Conservative MP Jerry Hayes. Battle it out next. Let me know what you think to email me down at gbnews.uk. Tweet me using the handle at gbnews. There's a, also a poll up there which you can vote in now. The results after the break. We are GB News. We are right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Brendan O'Neill and Laura Doddsworth coming up, but it's time now for The Clash. In a lance-stitched attempt to woo the Tory faithful up against True Blue Liz Truss, fishy Rishi Sunak has promised a 20% income tax card, which he says would represent the largest slashing of the income tax in 30 years. 
But here's the catch. Won't come until the end of the decade. Yep, just seven years to wait. So far, the former Chancellor, who berated Trust for her economic plan at the beginning of the contest, has suffered a huge backlash to his latest U-turn, which I would say is quite transparently designed to resurrect his flagging campaign. Simon Clark, Sunak's deputy at the Treasury, but now a Trust supporter, said Liz will cut taxes in seven weeks, not seven years. And traditional Tory John Redwood questioned Rishi's whole philosophy, tweeting... How will Rishi Sunak, with his current high taxes, achieve the growth to pay for tax cuts in six years' time? Why should we believe in his fantasy tax cuts for the next parliament when he has made the cost of living squeeze worse with tax rises now? So, what do you think? Is Fishy Rishi Sunak's 2029 tax card pledge too little too late? Dan at GBNews.uk. Tweet me at GBNews. Our poll running there too. Uh, the results shortly. But joining me now to debate this is Conservative commentator Alex Dean, Assistant Comment Editor at the Daily Telegraph, Olivia Utley, and former Conservative MP Jerry Hayes. So, Alex Dean, to me, this feels incredibly desperate. He spent the whole start of the campaign insisting he wasn't going to cut taxes. Now he says he will, but we're going to have to wait till 2029. Yeah, look, I, you kind of feel sorry for the guy. You understand the situation <laughs> he's in. He was Chancellor until very recently, and the economy is the central battleground. So if on the one hand he said everything's terrible and we've got to do radical things, people would say, but you were Chancellor until five minutes ago. Surely it was on your watch that it became terrible. And if, on the other hand, he said, uh, everything's broadly speaking fine and we should carry on as we are, people would say, or most people would say, well, probably it isn't. So he's really in a difficult situation. But th this is actually the worst step for him to take, I think, because he should, I think, have just stuck to his guns and said, prudence is all, we've got to balance the books, because at least people believe that he stood for that. Now with this U-turn, he undermines all of the attacks he'd previously made on the other candidates, and especially Liz Truss, because you'll remember he said that other people's uh, tax cuts was fantasy economics. Well, what are we supposed to think tax cuts offered seven years from now are going to be, given the changing economic cycles that come so quickly? It's impossible to say where the economy is going to be seven uh, years from now. You either believe in tax cuts to stimulate growth or you don't. I mean, Olivia Utley, it, it does feel like one of those pledges meant to hoodwink us. And then you read the small print and it says, oh, hang on a moment, you're going to have to wait until 2029. I mean, absolutely. This feels very much like he's offering some red meat to Conservative members who I don't think the Chancellor has ever really understood. Um, I think he's a very t clever and talented man, but I think at heart he's a bit of a technocrat and I don't think he's particularly interested in how the Conservative membership works. And I think um, Alex talked there and, and you've spoken as well about the about the delay, which I completely agree with Alex, that either you are either you have the philosophy, either you believe that tax cuts help to stimulate growth and therefore you can afford to have a have a low tax economy, a small state economy, and the economy is going to keep growing and growing and growing, or you don't believe that. But the other thing is, the other small print is that actually when, once you've priced in his national insurance rise, which is enormous, then I've got the figures in front of me here. And even in nine years' time, someone earning an average salary in the UK, sort of 30, £35,000, will only be a bit, be a bit about 50 quid better off than they were before. So it's not just that the delay is absolutely massive. It's also that the national insurance rights, I mean, income tax, great, but not actually that broader base of people as you might expect pay income tax. If you were really serious about cutting taxes, you would obviously be cutting national insurance tax and certainly not proceeding with the rise mm. in national insurance tax. So it's, you know, right. re rearranging debt as on the Titanic hardly even cuts it. Jerry Hayes, you disagree and you think Liz Truss is being irresponsible with her tax cut pledges, am I right? Of course she's being totally irresponsible. I mean, some of us, like me, in 1976, used to advise the shadow cabinet. We used to advise Margaret Thatcher. She believed in sound money. She never said we're going to have tax cuts unless we could afford it. She never said we're going to borrow. Liz Truss is now saying, oh, this fiscal headroom of £30 billion. She might as well put the money on a horse, the Grand National. She'll probably get a better result. What Rishi Sunak is saying is, look, let's believe in sound money. We'll do it through growth, not through borrowing. And that's the essence of it all. But I'll tell you what really depressed me tonight about the debate with dear old Liz is she said something which will hit the headlines tomorrow. Now, you probably, you guys will probably agree with it. 
me it was a really stupid thing to say. What? She said, ignore Nicola Sturgeon. Oh, yeah. She's a vision seeker. That is an act of insanity, because whether you agree with Nicola Sturgeon, I don't agree with her at all. And I don't want another referendum for another generation, as was promised by Alex Salmon. The fact is, you've now upset a Scot, which is a stupid, stupid thing to do. The big question here is, do you guys want the Tories to win the next election? Or do you want to support Liz, who's not very good? She's so wouldn't you could, you know, creosota, uh, not a great communicator, not very charismatic. Or do you want Keir Starmer to do it? Look at the well, opinion polls. Keir, to, 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 um, be honest, Richard, Jerry, to be honest, Jerry, what I don't yeah. want is a, a perfectly varnished globalist like Sunak, who has all of the shiny oratory and policies that I simply do not trust. And I have to say, Olivia, tonight, I, I disagree with Jerry because tonight what I've seen from Liz Truss is true conviction, true conviction that she is going to battle Nicola Sturgeon and true conviction on the point that I have been hammering home for the past two years, no more lockdowns. And I don't believe we would get either of those pledges from Rishi Sunak, Olivia. Yeah, say that with a straight face. True oh, conviction. I mean it. Oh, I mean it. I have been waiting, Jerry. Jerry, I have been waiting for a senior politician in this country, aside from Lord Frost, to come out and pledge no more lockdowns. Well, finally tonight, I got it. And to be honest, Olivia, if I was a Conservative Party member, I would vote for Truss on that pledge alone. Because we're here because of lockdowns. So would I. And I mean, the problem with Rishi Sunak, he's been... Pickled by the Treasury. That's the issue. I think that he was, he is a, a competent politician. He's an intelligent man, but he's been taken over by yeah. the establishment. And I think that yeah. Liz Truss, the, the truth is, I wasn't a fan of her when this campaign began. I thought she was wooden. I yes, can't hear you, I'm was, afraid, John. Wait your turn, <laughs> Jerry. For years. I can't hear that. But <laughs> um, I think, I think we'll come back to you. the amount that she's improved in the last six weeks is astonishing. I've never seen yeah. anything quite like it. Yeah. Um, I think she's coming across pretty impressive now. And I think, as you say, she is a conviction politician. She's been a classical liberal all her life. I mean, she's changed her minds when the facts have changed. But actually, she's believed in one philosophy. And I think that being anti-lockdown exactly suits the yeah. type of politics that she's espoused, even ever since she was a Lib Dem. So I'm feeling pretty confident about a Liz Truss premiership now. Alex Dean? Yeah, she's always been on the side of freedom of the individual. That's why she spent a good amount of time um, in the think tanks on the right, for which she's received flack from the left. I mean, it's clear that there is some intellectual capital there, which many in the Labour Party don't like. Um, and I suppose the other thing I, I would say about it is that um, whilst Rishi Sunak is certainly more polished, as, as Jerry suggests, uh, the, the trust campaign has very ably uh, turned that negative into a positive and saying, yes, I know I'm unvarnished, but, you know, I speak uh, the truth and I've got convictions. And I think people accept that. But moreover, you know, in the end, this the main topic you wanted us to debate tonight is the point. Two weeks ago, Sunak didn't want tax cuts. Now he does. That's the kind of thing that really torpedoes a, uh, a campaign below the waterline. And no matter how many times he interrupts in a debate against Liz Truss, or how many times Jerry interrupts tonight, those kinds of policies <laughs> cannot be seen, uh, cannot okay. be failed to be seen through by the British public. Okay, well, I'm, I'm about to let Jerry loose. Jerry, go for it. The floor is yours. Come on. She's a conviction politician, okay? She was a Liberal Democrat. She wanted to abolish the monarchy. She's a conviction politician. She passionately believed in being a Re Remainer. She's a conviction politician. She passionately believes in Brexit. For heaven's sake, remember the words. To the words of Jim Callaghan, actually, 1978. You can't spend your way out of a recession. She's got a dash for growth, she says, and it's by spending. What happened to the Heath government? What destroyed the Heath government? It was the dash for growth under Barber. It led to inflation. It led to spiralling prices, and it led to a total disaster. Okay, but Jerry, That's Jerry, you must, <laughs> Jerry, you have to accept though that we are in the economic predicament we are in today because Rishi Sunak has taken us. 
to the biggest tax burden for 70 years, and he was responsible for giveaway after giveaway after yeah. giveaway as he locked down the economy that has led to part of this cost of living, or as I call it, the cost of lockdown mm -hmm. crisis, Jerry. Mm -hmm. That's on him. He actually saved the economy, and Boris Johnson was saying, what a wonderful chance we've got. The cabinet was saying, what a wonderful chance we've got. And now... Well, Liz Truss opposed the national insurance this. rise in cabinet. I mean, really, it's got to get real. Right. Do the Tories win this election or we just... Alex have Dean, you want to come in? Yeah, I do, please. I mean, it, I, it's very enjoyable to revisit uh, history and, and get to rebut Jerry on the Heath government. But I think what brought the Heath government down was the unions and the inability to oppose the unions. And the Trust campaign, like most people on... Uh, on the fiscal right aren't proposing to spend their way out of recession. They're proposing to have tax cuts to stimulate the economy. Yes, it's not what the beginning of the Margaret Thatcher era uh, looked at, although it's much closer to the end of the Thatcher era with Nigel Lawson's budgets. It's exactly what Ronald Reagan uh, pursued, if you like your example from the 70s and the 80s, about giving people more of their own money, getting the state off your back. And if it means the state going into debt to empower you to do that, that's where you get the growth. And in the end, I think John Redwood is right. If you're not oh. going to have any tax cuts, how are you going to stimulate the kind of growth you say you're going to have to deliver tax cuts in seven years' time? Mm, but anything. Reagan nor Thatcher did it through borrowing. That's the point. OK. I mean, Reagan. we're paying Final off... Final word to you, Olivia. Legacy. Final word to you. Sorry, as, as Dan says, I mean, it's the cost of lockdown that we're paying off now. This what genuinely was a once-in-a-generation price. It's not like everyday spending that Liz Truss is proposing to, to borrow, to, to pay off. The other thing is that I just want to, to, <laughs> to, to raise here is that Jerry talks about Rishi Sunak as though he's an automatic election winner. I don't quite understand why a swing voter would prefer technocratic, bureaucratic you know, middle managing Rishi to Starmer, who seems to be promising pretty yeah. much the same thing, but yeah. a little bit more. Oh, and exactly. Like exactly. And, and you know what? Good. We need a true conservative in the job. I think see how much she's grown over the past six weeks. Let's see what happens over the next six months. Of course, I hope she's going to be a Thatcher, not a Theresa May. Only time will tell. But right now, that pledge to not lock down the country again is good enough for me. Comment editor at the Daily Telegraph, Olivia Utley. Conservative commentator Alex Dean and the always effervescent former Conservative MP Jerry Hayes. Thank you all so much. So who do you agree with on that? Is Rishi Sunak's 2029 tax cut pledge too little too late? From former on Twitter, Truss has no idea. Rishi has at least been realistic. Honestly, we are in dire straits. From Luke, can promise anything you like if it's penciled in after the next general election because Tories won't be in power thanks to Sunak's mess over the last few months and then throwing his boss under the bus. I know where you're coming from, Luke. Steve on Twitter says, yes, and desperate an illustration of his flip-flop policies and a liability to the Conservatives. Your verdict, now in. <laughs> this one isn't close, folks. 95% of you agree that Rishi Sunak's tax pledge is too little too late. Just 5% of you back in the former Chancellor. Coming up, why are the world's elite obsessed with getting us to eat bugs? A state affair author Laura Dodsworth tackles this baffling bit of net zero extremism as the outsider at 9.50. But first, how did one of the world's greatest sporting events turn into the common woke game? Spiked Online's Brendan O'Neill gives his verdict next. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. 
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Stay me to the studio, please, Matt. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7 p.m. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9 p.m. on GB News. Be there. Laura Dodsworth and Thomas Markle on the way. But first, if you thought the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham were a chance to celebrate Britain's sporting culture, think again. In the eyes of the intolerant left, they're a perfect platform for self-flagellation over Britain's colonial history. Thursday's opening ceremony saw a frankly remarkable array of virtue signalling and the result was a total loss of sporting joy with bitter poems about intolerance and moments like this from so-called comedian Joe Lycett. Do something now that the British government doesn't always do and welcome some foreigners. I mean, I could see where things were going when I tuned in to the Beeb's 6pm news on the day of the game's launch, uh, where they painted uh, the Commonwealth as racist, colonial, outdated, oh, and a waste of money too, look. Some, the occasion hasn't lived up to its motto of games for everyone. For example, the organising board was accused of lacking diversity. We know with the Windrush scandal hasn't been fully resolved yet. Families torn apart, people who spent all their lives here, people who were born in Caribbean countries and African countries and parts of Asia. When the Union flag flew over those countries, being told you have no right to be here, and then we're saying, oh, yes, but we embrace our Commonwealth family. It does say double standard. The city of Birmingham's official slogan is forward. And ultimately, the legacy these games leave behind will be far more important than the medals won. Brendan O'Neill summed up the nonsense brilliantly by dubbing them the BBC's common woke games. I love that. In his latest column for Spiked Online, he writes, what ought to have been a sparkling celebration of Blighty ahead of a two-week sporting festival that is exactly the pick-me-up this troubled nation needs was turned by the Beeb and the Birmingham Glitterati and he had another opportunity to heck to Joe Public about issues. Millions must have switched off. I mean, Brendan, look, I love the Commonwealth Games. I always have. But it was so obvious to me from that day of launch that the BBC uh, was going to do all they could to ruin them, which is completely ironic, by the way, given they're broadcasting the thing for hours and hours at Norseyham. It's bizarre, isn't it? You know, we have a Commonwealth Games, which is supposed to be a celebration of the Commonwealth and of athletics. And instead, we get a lecture through that poem about how awful the Commonwealth has been historically, what a racist country the United Kingdom has been over the past. We had images of National Front marches and swash stickers painted on walls in the 1960s and 70s in the UK. It was basically the BBC wagging its finger at the public, at the viewers who tuned in, and saying, you live in a pretty horrible, racist country. And I don't think that's the message people want or should get when they tune in to watch a bit of sport. And, Brendan, you also have an interesting take on this appearance uh, at the opening ceremony from Tom Daly. So, so he was there with 35 other Pride flag bearers, and the intention was to represent the 35 countries of the Commonwealth where uh, homosexuality is still a crime. But you say this is quite ironic because... <laughs> for, for if people were against colonialism, you could argue that this is us hectoring African nations again. Explain what you mean. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the ceremony kicked off with uh, the BBC through that poet telling us that the Commonwealth used to boss around lesser nations, apparently uncivilised nations. And then it ended with Tom Daly coming on, making a big spectacle of lecturing those Commonwealth nations that haven't caught up with us yet 
on homosexual equality. So out with the old colonialism, in with the new. You know, it used to be the Union flag that would be waved as Britain conquered foreign countries. Now it's the pride flag that is used as a flag of kind of moral conquest. So it was quite ironic that they ended up lecturing certain Commonwealth countries. The other problem, of course, with the current pride flag is that it currently includes um, the trans colors too. And the problem with the trans ideology is that it, some people who adhere to the trans ideology argue that same-sex attraction is a form of prejudice. Because if you're a gay man and you refuse to have sex with a, a, a trans woman, then apparently you're a bigot. And if you're a lesbian who refuses to have sex with women with penises, apparently, according to Stonewall, that's a form of sexual mm racism. So the current flag doesn't even work as a defense of same-sex rights because it's been no. co-opted by the woke trans ideology. So I just thought there was a great deal of irony to the waving of that flag. at the Yeah, end and of the there's ceremony. certainly a big division in the gay community around it. I mean, it just feels to me, Brendan, that the BBC can never just let sport be sport anymore. Everything yeah has to be filled with political message. And you write in your column, actually, that they excitedly reported that unlike at the Olympics, athletes at the Commonwealth Games can use their platforms to protest against social injustice as if that's a great thing. And we can't forget what the BBC did earlier in the Euros uh, either, Brendan. So now they love the Lionesses. Well, just a few weeks ago, they were moaning about the fact that they were all white. Yeah, the irony is just hysterical. You know, you had the BBC saying, oh, my God, the lionesses are so white, it's terrible. Uh, the Guardian was saying something similar. I think the Guardian published a piece saying, you know, this team is not going to inspire girls because it's not diverse enough. I think some of those people will be eating their words now because the whole country, black, white, whatever they are, are absolutely thrilled by the lionesses' win and really came together to cheer that team on. So I think the victory of the lionesses is a real punch in the face to this kind of divisive identity politics. And the fact that the BBC and others were rushing ahead with this narrative that said the lionesses are too white and that's somehow a problem, I think they really exposed how obsessed they are with race, whereas everyone else in the country just wants to come together, enjoy a shared national moment like that final victory and get on with life rather mm. than obsessing over what people look like or where they come from. And, and by the way, Brendan, and this is a little personal moan about the BBC, but they say they care about women's sport. Uh, unless it comes to the netball at the Commonwealth Games, Brendan, outrage over the weekend in the netball community, quite rightly, because the BBC uh, didn't think it was worth putting on one of their feeds uh, for the Commonwealth Games. So the coverage is terrible as well, which is why the BBC should just be defunded. And if a broadcaster like Discovery was broadcasting the Commonwealth Games, just like uh, they did with the Olympics, we would be able to watch whatever we want uh, because it would be there available to us. So sorry, Brendan, just had to get that in there because the BBC's <laughs> Common Woke Games coverage has infuriated me in so many ways. Brendan O'Neill, thank you so much. But coming up, it's come home courtesy of the Lionesses, but with the hypocritical left still struggling to define a woman, will this victory help protect women's sport? I'll debate that with my superstar panel in the media buzz at 10. We're going to have the first look at tomorrow's newspapers. I have a feeling the Lionesses might feature on those too. But first, why are net zero extremists, the MSM and virtue signaling celebrities, desperate to get us eating insects? A state affair author Laura Dodsworth is crawling with rage over the escalating war on meat. She's tonight's outsider next. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. 
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. A first look at tomorrow's newspaper front pages and the return of Thomas Markle coming up in the next hour. But first, Laura Doddsworth is tonight's outsider. If needless lockdowns and endless curbs on our freedoms weren't proof enough of nudge politics and action, now the MSM, virtue sickening celebrities and net zero obsessives in the establishment are on a campaign to get us eating bugs. Over the last few weeks, even our Food Standards Agency has been attempting to turn us off meat and brainwash us into thinking that consuming insects is normal. Don't believe me? <laughs> Watch this. I'm Nicole Kidman, and I am going to eat a four-course meal of bugs. They're still alive. Mmm. Extraordinary. What is that? Well... Uh, that's an insect-based premium protein. It's made from Molitor, which is mealworm larvae. It is, the, the, the making of it is severely reducing the, the amount of emissions it takes. Are you saying all animal farming, in, in, in your opinion, really needs to stop? Yes, it does. It really does. Um, it's a bit like leaving fossil fuels in the ground. Unless we do that, we've really got very little chance indeed of preventing this domino effect of system collapse. So just what is compelling elites to nudge us into a bug heavy diet? Laura, the acclaimed author of A State Affair, joins me now to try and get to the bottom of it. Laura, what's this about? Is it another example of nudge? I mean, there's this concerted campaign. Yeah. I don't think anyone could have failed to miss it, which is designed to get us to consume creepy, crawly critters. Um, you've got the United Nations uh, with their edible insect project, the World Economic Forum, as you said here in the, the, the UK government, the Food Standards Agency is consulting. The EU has made mealworms um, legal and safe in legislation. Um, and there's a slew of of celebrities and a veritable swarm of articles telling us about how eating insects is healthy, sustainable, and it offers a six-legged solution to world hunger. The funny thing is we're not yet embracing eating insects. So why is that? Um, the thing is there's a biological diktat behind this. We are programmed to find insects revolting. Now you'll notice in lots of articles, we're told repeatedly that two billion people around the world eat insects. There's a reason for that. It's to make it seem normal. That's why we're told. But here in the West, we don't. It's not part of our cultural lexicon. We think of fish and chips as English. We think of roast beef and Yorkshire pudding as English. We don't yet think of mealworms and crickets as no. very English. Because and and, and Laura, one of the reasons they eat so many bugs is because of places like North Korea, where it is absolute starvation and there's a complete lack of food. Uh, I've actually tried these bugs live on the show before and I can assure you they do not taste good they do not taste like normal food that they, they taste truly horrifically revolting and I will never put one of them in my mouth again <laughs> um I tried eating a cricket once in Mexico and first of all I thought oh I don't fancy this I'll pick the wings off and then I still didn't fancy it so I pit the legs off and I thought I still don't fancy it so I pit the head off and then I was left <laughs> with the thorax and I still didn't want it but you'll see in that Nicole Kidman video, which is a few years old now, there's been a whole raft of videos from various celebrities since. She keeps talking about how yummy they are. There was a BBC no, News not. article recently from an author in Uganda saying that the smell of crickets is like the smell of Christmas. Well, for me, the smell of Christmas is turkey and pigs in blankets. But yes, you're right. In some countries, it's part of their tradition to eat insects. 
and sometimes it makes sense for them when there isn't a better source of good quality protein. Of course, here in this country, you know, world hunger is not really a problem because we have, you know, we're almost um, self-sufficient in meat, mm. milk, dairy, grains, potatoes and vegetables, actually. Um, so we don't really have that same compelling need to in insects. Also, insects are poisonous and we associate them with eating feces and waste and rotting carcasses. We think of them as uninvited guests in our home and on our bodies. They have lots of legs and they're jerky and they make unpredictable movements. They're not very appetizing. So that's why these organizations mm. are working so hard to persuade I know, us. We but but, but the problem is, as you exposed in your book, A State of Fear over the lockdowns, when you went inside the government machine to make us think in a particular way, when they get on to something, they're not going to stop. And I worry about the prospect of this becoming normalized simply because it's coming at us from all angles. Yes. Well, let me give you a few sneaky ways they're doing it. There's all the celebrity endorsements that you've seen. That makes it seem normal. It makes it seem visible. makes it also seem glamorous. You're probably going to mm. see male influencers turning their masculine jaws to chomp courageously on insects on Instagram and all the rest of it. But the um, government's nudge unit published and then very rapidly unpublished report on how to get consumers to change their behavior towards net zero. And one thing that report talked about was using schools and education mm. because children are more influenceable. Plus, once children are on side, that creates a multi-generational spillover. So in fact, there's a, trail, a trial coming up in Wales where school children will be invited into workshops which will facilitate discussion about alternative protein sources and they can try insects. They won't be served bog bolognese in the canteen, but it's mm. very much about influencing children. Another thing you'll see is um, what we call a foot in the door, although in this case it's more of a mandible in the door. A Finnish bakery has started putting cricket, cricket flour inside its loaves of bread. So if it's something you're used to eating, like a loaf of bread, and the cricket flour is only a minority and you try and it's not that bad, it just gets you used to the idea of insects and, and mm. as an ingredient. Well, totally. And, and Laura, I just wanted to show you this little BBC News exclusive that I found earlier. Let me read it to you because I think this sums up everything we're talking about. Angelina Jolie joined the campaign and is now promoting eating bugs and insects instead of meat. Wait for it, Laura. The World Economic Forum says eat insects, it's healthy and you're saving the planet. Well, let me tell you, if the World Economic Forum tells me to do something, I do the total opposite, and I think we all should. And Laura Dosworth has written a lot about this topic. I read it earlier, Laura, in your brilliant Substack, which I highly recommend you subscribe to. Laura, thank you. Thank you. It's 10 p.m. I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, as fallen Tory leadership candidate Penny Morden throws her support behind Team Trust and the Foreign Secretary herself makes a vow, that's music to my ears. Can I just ask you if you would ever authorise another lockdown? No. No. Yes, finally. So, of course, uh, with that climate, uh, an increasingly desperate fishy Rishi Sunak is trying to stay in the race for number 10. But what is this plan to find patients who miss NHS appointments £10 about? Is that an ingenious way to ease the pressure on our COVID crippled health service? My Superstar panel debate that at 10.30 tonight. I'm joined by Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the iNewspaper, Benjamin Butterworth, and the conservationist and former MEP, Stanley Johnson. Plus, after the Lionesses made history by bringing football home, will their success finally convince the lefty liberal hypocrites celebrating the momentous win that they need to protect women's sport? debate that next. Two months after a devastating stroke destroyed his jubilee dream, now Meghan's father Thomas Markle delivers his first major message to the British public. As his son Thomas Markle Jr. updates us on his health and tackles the latest Sussex scandals in a bombshell exclusive that's at 10.15. And after her heroic whistleblowing helped to shutter the unsafe Tavistock Clinic, detransitioned activist Kara Bell hopes her harrowing experience at the Gender Ideology Centre will not be in vain. She's uncancelled and railing against the, quote, medicalisation of children at 10.40. And is it pointless woke poli uh, policing like this for soaring crime rates? If someone has been called, obviously, anxiety based upon your... Social media sites. That's not why you've been around. Aaron, I've got the
just unbelievable. We're going to get stuck into that shortly. Plus, you'll get a first look at tomorrow's newspaper. Front page is hot off the press throughout the next hour. Plus, brand new Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. An action-packed hour to come. But before all of that, the news with Polly Middlehurst. Dan, thank you. Good evening. As you've been hearing, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak are answering questions at the Conservative leadership hustings in Exeter right now, with both candidates vying for support from the Tory party faithful. Candidate Liz Truss acknowledged what she called the difficult times facing the country ahead, saying we now have to be bold. And earlier she made further policy announcements in her campaign to be Prime Minister, vowing to tackle post-Brexit restrictions to improve British farming. And other leadership candidate, Rishi Sunak, set out his vision for the economy this time, saying his plan is one of the most far-reaching initiatives to cut income tax people have seen. The former Chancellor committed to taking four pence off income tax within seven years if he becomes Prime Minister, cutting the basic rate of tax from 20 pence in the pound to 16 pence. Now, in other news today, Archie Battersby's mother says she feels her son has been let down by Britain's healthcare system. That's after the Court of Appeal ruled that the Royal London Hospital can switch off the 12-year-old's life support treatment at midday tomorrow. Archie has been in a coma since April. Court of Appeal judges have refused to allow an appeal against their decision, but Archie's parents say they'll now appeal directly to the Supreme Court. GB News has learned today the number of small boats arriving in the UK has hit a record level, with the largest number of people crossing on a single day this year. More than 600 migrants are being processed as a result in Kent today, after authorities seized around a dozen small boats over a 10-hour period. More than 3,500 people crossed the Channel in July, in the highest monthly total this year. And the Lionesses' captain, Leah Williamson, says her team have changed the game of football, hopefully in this country and across the world. A record 87,000 fans watching the team beat Germany 2-1 last night in extra time at the Wembley Stadium. It's England's first major football championship win since the 1966 World Cup. Thousands of fans gathered at Trafalgar Square today in London to celebrate the historic win. And GB News' Paul Hawkins was there earlier. He says the team are inspirational for women and girls. A really significant day as well for gender equality because this is the culmination of over 100 years of discrimination against women. 50 years ago, the ban was lifted by the FA on women playing football. And then even after that, they were told, well, you can play football, but, you know, women... You're not very good. Women having to fight against that resistance constantly that they're not good enough, that they'll never be good enough, that they won't be able to achieve that level of professionalism that the men have. Well, this has blown that out of the water. 17.4 million people watched that final last night and it felt like the culmination of those, those, that resilience that those women showed all those decades ago, right up now to the players' performances yesterday in that final. Lioness's incredible victory yesterday against Germany in the Euro 2022 final. You're up to date on TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News and let's get back to Dan Wooden tonight. Tomorrow's news tonight now on our media buzz. The front pages are in, and as I predicted, the Lionesses feature. Let's kick off with the Metro, which talks about them partying with fans the day after winning Euro 2022. England's ecstatic women football stars danced and sang their hearts up with 7,000 fans to celebrate their historic victory. More on that in a mo. The I lead with an exclusive insight into Boris Johnson's so-called blame game. According to the paper, Boris is blaming the 2019 intake of Tory MPs for his downfall and believes they spent too much time on Twitter. Here, here to that. Rather than forging party allegiances in Westminster, which apparently left them, quote, flaky, neurotic and lacking robustness. The Daily Star leads with why the long face as it splashes on the story of the bear-loving pony Patrick 
who has just been made the unofficial mayor of Cockington in Devon after a petition, uh, being barred from his local pub. OK. I'll have to understand that one later, I think. Uh, Liz Truss is the candidate of hope, declares Penny Morden, a sentiment I personally agree with. This is after the former frontrunner for PM gave her backing to Truss. Under that, dangerous prisoners are set to be blocked from automatic release. My superstar panel back with me now, Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, star reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and conservationist and former MEP Stanley Johnson. Now, as I said at the start of the show, as a champion of women's sport for many decades, I'm utterly over the moon at the inspiring and historic Lioness Euros win. But hours after the momentous victory last night, something important struck me too. How can so many of those celebrating also be willing to jeopardise female sports by refusing to simply define what a woman is? Prime hypocrite Slippery Gear Starmer took to Twitter after the final whistle to congratulate the team, writing... The Lionesses, you have inspired a generation of women and girls. My daughter and her friends have strong, successful role models in sport because of you. The entire nation is so proud. That's ironic, though, when mere months ago, the leader of no opposition gave this farce of a reply when asked about the travesty of US trans swimmer Leah Thomas smashing her biological female rivals. A woman can have a penis. <laughs> Nick, I'm not... I don't think we can conduct this debate with, you know... Sorry, have I, I, get I offended this, you in some No, way. no, no, it's just... Uh, no, 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 I just... A I woman can have a penis. I don't think that um, discussing this issue in this way helps anyone in the long run. As I write in a new column for the Mail Online today, what the virtue signalling brigade like Starmer failed to grasp is that by refusing to address fundamental biological questions in a factual manner... They are damning sport for girls, including his daughter and her friends, into potential oblivion. Carol Malone, I mean, it's incredible to see the Lionesses' victory, but we do have to think for a moment about how women's sport finds itself oh. under threat and all you would need on one of those teams, whether it's the German or the England team last night, is one biological male and you could throw the whole game out the window. And this is what's at threat. And that's why I find what Starmer said so hypocritical. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. But, but I also think that without having um, a biological male on the team, women's sport, as this football particularly has been in trouble. You know, the history of women's football has been a history of male privilege. Why? Because men have always believed it was their game. And I think the game, I think now they don't need, they don't just need protection. Women need equality now in this particular sport. You know, we've got, we've got, you know, players, do, do you remember when the Euros, the men, the Euros fan last year, when, the, when we were playing? If we had won last year, the men would have got a million... The players, the male players would have got a million quid each. Do you know what the girls are getting for winning yesterday? No, 55 grand. I mean, it's... But it's market it's, forces. It's not to be sniffed at. But it's market forces that we have created as a society by not acknowledging that women can and want to play football. But that it's... will change over time. I mean, look at tennis now, where you've got uh, the Williams sisters make... Not necessarily the same amount of money, but they make a huge amount. Yeah, of money. but this is this doesn't begin to compare. You know, FIFA did a, a global um, employment record in 2017, and they discovered that 50% of all female football players all over the world. Um, got no money at all for playing. They had to do it for the love of the sport. So women in this country have been playing football for the love of it for decades, while men have been raking in multi-millions for it. And that's what has to stop, actually. That's what has to stop. Stanley? It... No, I think I, I think I agree um, with what Carol says. One of the things, of course, is the fact that the money hasn't gone in to the mm. facilities for the, mm. for the women's ball. And somebody told me, I don't know whether it's right or not, that they don't necessarily, even if they're Manchester United women's team, they don't necessarily get to play in, no. you know, in, the, in, in, the, in the best stadium. Do you see? And yes, yeah, some, that, that some, sort of some women are playing. There's a law with FIFA that says there have to be equal opportunities. They, they just aren't. Some women are, are playing on AstroTurf. They're buying their own football boots. To put it into context, the money thing, one professional male player earns more in a year than every single woman footballer in the seven in the seven 
top leagues. Now, just think about that for a second. So uh, that, that's what I think has to happen now. I'm not worried about, um, uh, you know, a, a trans a trans woman playing in a, in a, in a team. I, I think the women have got lots more to worry about before that happens. They've got to get equality now. And, and the great thing about what the Lionesses do, have done, they've made that possible because now the big money men in sport will come to them. Mm. Now they will get sponsorship. Now they will get decent grounds to play on. They're still going to have some opposition, I think, from men and from male players and from, from the men in the league because they will not want to give this game to women. Do you, know, you know what happened in the war? That it was taken. Women yeah. played in the 1800s. Then in, in, in early 19, I think it was 1902, they were banned. Then in the First World War, they were allowed to play again. Then they were banned again for decades. So, you know, women have been held back in this sport all of the time, you know, for, literally for decades. Benjamin, that has to change. Do you think in this country, though, we need to look at something like what Ron DeSantis has done in Florida, where he has now signed a new law that says boys play boys' sports and girls play girls' sports? No, obviously not. And I think the only thing louder than the roar at Wembley is you trying to sound of you trying to scrape the barrel to have a culture war argument when this is a moment of unity. You know, 23 million between streams and live audience watched that yeah. Wembley game on Sunday Yes, because night, it's which women is a, which competing is truly, against women. Which is I, a truly I, incredible number. But that's because it's women competing against women. You, you must understand that women's sport is at threat. We've seen that with Leah Thomas. We've seen that with Emily Bridges. I mean, the threat, as Carol said several of the things I was going to say, you know, the threat to women's sport has been the intentional excluding by men of access to facilities. Yeah. So Alex Scott, who was anchoring some of that uh, coverage last night, she pointed out rather sharply, and I think w with good reason, that lots of the big football clubs had refused to let their own women's teams use the stadiums. Mm. And now, look, 87,192 people, I think it was 83,192, a record number were in the Wembley Stadium, more than have been there for any men's match, let alone any women's match. And so now I reckon you're going to have a lot of money men, and hopefully some money women, women uh, chasing these talented players to get them to go in. I mean, my niece plays for Manchester United's uh, youth women's team. So, you know, I know that there's lots of people coming through that want to make this their career. And what, what's you've astonish a niece. what's <laughs> astonishing is, though, that, that nothing has changed since 1902 when, when the FIFA... Do I mean FIFA? No, I mean the FA. The FA punished the, the male clubs that let women use their facilities. They punished them. They find them, which, which is astonishing, and nothing which has changed. Mm. I want to come back a moment to Dan's point. Mm. Um, the point we began this conversation on, which is the, you know, quote, unquote, the transgender mm. one, uh, I have some sympathy with Governor DeSantis. Yeah, it could be that he's going to throw his hat in the ring you know, for the, mm. you know, but, and maybe, maybe this plays well. But I think there's something to be said for, for that, and OK, yeah, it, it may be an irregular occurrence, but we're seeing quite a lot of examples, aren't we, where a transgender person has really taken over what was a, a woman's sport. I mean, we're not seeing lots of examples. You could count them on your fingers, right? And the truth is there are none of them in women's football. But what there was last night was actually, and you don't have this at mm. any serious level of the men's game, is there were several lesbian and bisexual female players. Mm. And, you know, yeah. it, it wasn't even a, a matter of discussion, but that is a rather well, refreshing thing. And it thing. shouldn't be a matter of discussion. And also, it's in a fact, completely different thing. In fact, what it's was lovely... Sexuality what was lovely versus biology. They are completely and, and what different. Was, I was, sorry, what I was, was just going to say quickly, was what was lovely is that one of the... Uh, women playing for England last night is in a relationship with one of the women she was playing against from Germany. Now, that's definitely a first. And, but, 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 but what... that, that doesn't impact their physical ability to play the game, which... Oh. And, and I think uh, where you're very naive, Benjamin, you're not obviously a fan of women's sport, is you don't <laughs> I'm not a fan of women's or men's football, to be well, clear. You don't understand I don't watch it. Uh, that it's so yeah. impossible to reverse male yeah. puberty. I mean, I just think you're trying to you're trying to create a fear where there is none in yeah, this situation. Think, think... And, and actually, you know, I think it's really... I actually agree with you for once. Well, good. Well, it's good. I might have to change my opinion. Oh, OK. Uh... <laughs> Can we listen see, I, I actually completely disagree, and I'll tell you why. Because, and I know Sharon Davies feels the same thing, and she's obviously been the champion of this argument for many months. Actually, this is the moment we need to talk about it because it's when women's sport is in the headlines for all the right reasons. And you are very naive. Both of you are very naive if you don't think women's sport is currently under threat, because but it is. When it happens, we'll deal with it. But what I think happened yesterday, you know, there's been a lot of sneering and a lack of respect 
for women footballers. That's out the window now. No one's going to sneer at these women again. That's mm. one of the problems Absolutely. gone. People are going to respect them. That's another thing. So if what you're, if what you say happens, hap what you say could happen, does happen, we'll be ready for it. No one's going to allow these women to be put through anything because they have made us all proud. Well, so no, because Benjamin, Benjamin genuinely believes, and, and his ilk genuinely believe that a trans woman should be able to play in the Lionesses. That's Do you just believe that? No, I don't believe I don't believe that. No, he that? does believe Actually, that. Actually, no, I've always argued something <laughs> more nuanced, which is that, you know, it, because transgender is an incredibly umbrella term. So someone who started transitioning at 25 and was fully developed as a, as a male before they did it, I, I think that would almost certainly be inappropriate and unfair. But you get people that, that are of a different build in the first place that start transitioning, you know, in the teenage years, maybe have puberty blockers. And for sports like weightlifting, for example, where it's measured on the size of the person, it might not be a problem. You well, had the darts to... championships that banned transgender we women. Well, I'm not sure that... being trans has anything to do with darts. Well... You know, this is a political context. We may not have a chance to come back to it. But I personally was extremely happy to see that the Tavistock Clinic was going to be, was going to be mm. shut down. Mm. Now, this is vaguely related to the, no, it is. To the, to mm. the whole issue. And the, other thing, the other thing I wanted to just toss in on this one is the playing field situation. We've seen the disappearance of playing fields, schools selling off their playing fields all over England. Mm. And this, above all, is going to hit also the, 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 the women who we want to come, come to the Good school. point. And Benjamin, do you want to come back? Because we've got Kara Ballon later, who yeah. obviously is one of the people who fought so hard against the Tavistock Clinic. But do you want to... But clearly the problem with the Tavistock... Clearly Brett there was a problem with Tavistock that. Clinic. That's and that's problem. that they weren't making appropriate decisions in a handful of cases, in some cases. And so the answer we, there the, is, to have, is to have more doctors, more medical professionals... It was, not a, ha it was not a handful of cases. The staff in that, that clinic were telling the, 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 the children, some of them as young as 10, that the puberty blockers that were giving them, the effects were totally reversible when they had no yeah. data to support that, none whatsoever. So, I mean, so it was very... So th 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 that report... The report, Benjamin, was damning. Hilary Cass's report was damning of that clinic. The answer to, it wasn't a handful The answer of to when people have said that a mistake was made in their case isn't to shut down a clinic and shut down the access to medical no, professionals. You try telling that it's to, to care more medical professionals I, so you get life listen, has been ruined. But also, Dan, and I, I talk to Kira, but also talk to Kira about how many people she knows now are detransitioning. Of course. Because I think she's part of an organisation. There's an epidemic of it. Yeah, yeah. there's an epidemic of it. Carol Malone. There is not. Benjamin there is. There Stanley is Johnson, thank you so much. But watch out, folks. The Thought Police are no longer an Orwell in creation, but a real threat to free speech. This is the moment. Former veteran Darren Bradley was last week arrested at his home in Aldershot after sharing a tweet that officers claimed had upset someone somewhere on the internet. Look. No. <coughs> Does which Hampshire police would realise how ridiculous this is? It is. It is. Of course, I'm happy to come to this. What did it need to come to? Tell us why you escalated it to this level. Because I don't understand. I posted something that he posted, you come to arrest me, you don't arrest him. Why has it come to this? Why am I in cuffs? Because of something he shared, then I shared. Because someone has been caused, obviously, anxiety based upon your social media post. That's We're not his. why you've been arrested. I mean, arrested for causing anxiety? I have to admit, I have anxiety watching the police <laughs> cast off a man for refusing to take part in an £80 re-education course, which is what ultimately landed him in the cuffs. What is this? Communist China? Now, this video was filmed by Reclaim Party leader Lawrence Fox, the original poster of that tweet that saw Mr Bradley targeted, which rearranged the LGBT flag into a swastika. Might not agree with that, but should you be arrested for posting it? Also present was the party's chairman, Harry Miller, a former police officer himself who was arrested but later released pending an investigation for trying to stop the apprehension of Mr Bradley. Both of these outspoken men have graced Dan Wooten tonight as part of the, bland, the Bad Law Project, which pledges to challenge and depoliticise our dangerously woke institutions. So I imagine cops will probably be busting down the studio door any moment, declaring me an accessory to the crime. I'm sure this programme might cause someone somewhere anxiety. But guess what? That's freedom <laughs> of speech. Deal with it.
Coming up, should Brits be forced to pay up if they miss an NHS appointment? Fishy Rishi Sunak thinks so, but what about my superstar panel? They'll return for my media bus at 10.30. More papers on the way then too. But next, two months after a devastating stroke dashed his hopes of reuniting with his daughter Meghan at the Platinum Jubilee, Thomas Markle delivers his first major message to the British public. His son, Thomas Markle Jr., will update us on his health too and tackle the latest Sussex scandals in a bombshell interview next. Don't miss it. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Welcome back. Over two months ago, Thomas Markle saw his jubilee dream and hopes of reunion with his daughter, the Duchess of Sussex, tragically dashed after suffering a devastating stroke. Since I broke the story on this show with the permission of the family, we haven't heard or seen from Thomas, but he's finally well enough to give you, his supporters in Great Britain, an important message. Amid continued radio silence from Meghan, we'll also get an update on his recovery from his primary carer son, Thomas Markle Jr. And as always... Uh, the royal runaways are attempting to tear the monarchy apart with the release of a scathing autobiography. And the Duke is, of course, sensationally coming under fire from Supreme Court justices to for political meddling. So what does the Markle family make of these latest Sussex scandals? Thomas Markle Jr. joins me live now from Mexico. But first, Thomas, the thing we need to know, how is your dad doing in terms of the recovery from his stroke? Hey, Dan. Uh, hey, people of Britain. Uh, thanks for having me again. Uh, Dad is doing amazing. It's, um, I mean, it, it's, there's a lot of work to do, but every single day is just another milestone progression all the way in the right direction, which is uh, ult ultimate recovery on everything. He's, he's doing fantastic. He's, I, it, it, I his think mind is all there, body's all there, and we're just making incredible progress every day. And is he getting his voice back at all, Thomas? A absolutely. Um, we go to many appointments, speech therapist appointments, and every day it gets a little better. Some days aren't so good, but then the next day it's like, almost like nothing ever happened. So, yes, it's it's absolutely coming back 100%. Okay, and we're going to play this video now. This is the first look at Thomas Markle uh, since he suffered his stroke. Watch. Go ahead. Ah, uh, Thomas, bless you, bless you. Will Britain 
sends you our regards, Thomas. Uh, Thomas Jr., have you heard from Meghan or Harry? Has your dad heard from his daughter? Uh, no, not at all. Nothing at all. Absolute zero. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. What's to be expected at this point? She, you know, she didn't call for the first heart attack or the stroke. You know, why, why would she call now? I mean, you know. Um, obviously, I mean, they're just busy doing other things, other uh, other things that are that they deem necessarily more important than their fault. And how is your dad coping with that, Thomas? That lack of contact. Um, Dad's okay with it. I mean, he's um, you know, I mean, of course, sad because it's it, you know, it's his daughter. I mean, I, I'd be I'd be incredibly, incredibly sad if my sons never called me or. I lost contact with them for some unforeseen reason, but it, it, it's a mystery. I mean, it, it does bother him continuously, but, uh, you know, he gets through it. Uh, of course, your sister has been in the news, as always, and I wanted to ask you about a couple of the more recent controversies. First, uh, this is a video clip of the Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito mocking uh, figures around the world, including Prince Harry, for the political position he took over the decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Watch. Really wounded me was when the Duke of Sussex addressed the <laughs> United Nations and seemed to compare the decision whose name may not be spoken with the Russian attack on Ukraine. I mean, that was so interesting to me, Thomas, because even now the mere mention of the Sussex word actually receives mocking laughter in America. Is that how much their stock has fallen? Well, you know, uh, I, I would say so, yes, because, you know, my father and I, we, we speak about this quite often. And, you know, it's you're going to a memorial for Mandela at the UN building, you know, which is an open invitation to anybody in the general public. And then you start talking world peace and politics which has nothing to do with anything there at that point. I mean, it's just like, you know, Sussex, Sussex is, they need to stick to like rescue chickens in Montecito and stay out of politics. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now there's also been the publication of this major new book on Harry and Meghan, Revenge by Tom Bauer. Now, lots emerged from this. One of the most fascinating facts I thought was that Bauer alleges Meghan did indeed do quite a bit of Googling about Harry before they started dating, despite her denials. What did you make of the book? Oh, gosh, honestly, you know, I haven't gotten a copy of the book yet. Um, I keep getting little tidbits of information given me here and there about, you know, I think um, um, Tom Bauer, I think he did a fantastic, spot on job. I mean, he you know, called it. Called it and did you have suspicions, Thomas, that your sister potentially had gone out of her way to snare Prince Harry? Because when you read the book, I, I've read it, uh, Thomas, when you read the book, you very much get the impression that this was all part of a grand plan for her to end up with Harry. You know, honestly, at this point, I, you know, I don't think it's snaring. I ain't glued to you. Um, you know, and she... Probably Netflix group at that point, trying to get a hold of Prince Harry. I don't, I don't know who's to say, but it sure looks fabricated. Mm, mm. And then just finally, Thomas, that the, the other big uh, rumor going around is that Meghan is becoming very serious about making it to the White House herself one day, is increasing her political activism. She spoke out in that interview with Vogue magazine, talking about how she planned to march on Washington, D.C. Uh, to, pro to protest against Roe versus Wade. Uh, when you were growing up with her, did, did you ever get a sense that she harbored political ambitions? Never, never got a sense that she was any after anything political whatsoever. It was always, you know, fairy tales and princesses, you know, stories about princesses. That, that's, that's what she focused on. So she's achieved that for sure. But as far as politics go, if if that ever happens, I'll probably 
probably move to the UK. <laughs> well, we will welcome you with open arms, Thomas. And of course, we are still holding both you and Thomas Senior to get to London as soon as he is healthy enough. So look, send him our regards. He's making great progress. And we're going to do that trip come hell or high water. That is uh, Megan's brother, Thomas Markle Jr. Thank you so much live from Mexico. Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate it. Coming up, her heroic whistleblowing helped to shut down the unsafe to have a stock clinic. Now detransitioned activist Kara Bell reacts to this watershed moment in the battle to save children from the trans lobby. She is uncancelled at 10.40. But next, what do my superstar panel make of Fishy Rishi Sunak's plans to find patients who miss NHS appointments? Is that fair? We'll get into it and bring you more of tomorrow's uh, rawsome front pages on the Lioness's victory. That's straight after the break. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Let's return to tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. Lots more front pages have just been delivered. Everyone is buzzing as the Guardian's simple summation of the Lioness's victory. The Daily Express leads with Liz Truss, claiming that she is the real deal on tax. The Tory leadership frontrunner says the public can trust her to slash taxes this autumn and allow families to keep more of their hard-earned money. And in more policy pledges, Truss has told the Daily Mail that she plans to rip up nanny state plans to ban unhealthy, buy one, get one free meals. Above that story, fantastic quote from Julie Birchall on last night's Euros final. She's with me on this. She's with me. <laughs> in an age where women's very existence has been denied, this glorious show of bold femininity can change the world. My superstar panel back with me now. Daily Express star columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and conservationist and former MEP Stanley Johnson. Breaking tonight in the latest round of Tory leadership hustings, Liz Truss has made the emphatic and very welcome row that we will never again return to lockdown. Can I just ask you if you would ever authorise another lockdown? No. So, so privately, do you, do you think, think lockdown, lockdown was a bad idea? Well, every single chance I was given the opportunity to express a view, I was on the favour of doing less rather than more on lockdowns and opening up the economy earlier. Finally, I have wanted a senior politician to make that vow for such a long time. And there will be so many people voting for Liz Truss primarily 
because she has now ruled out further COVID lockdowns and further lockdowns full stop for anything, by the way. And if you thought that was good, it was Truss's response to the Scottish independence question that really brought the house down. And I think the best thing to do with Nicola Sturgeon is ignore her. I think she's... <laughs> Minister, she's got a I'm sorry, she's an attention seeker, sir. That's what she is. Oh, I love to see it. Trust, she's just getting better. All of those folk who said, oh, she's so wooden, she can't deliver a message. Have they seen her performance at these hustings at Sunak, who can't cope when he's off the auto queue? Meanwhile, uh, Fishy Rishi has declared he will introduce a £10 fine for missed GP and hospital appointments if he wins the battle to be PM. The former Chancellor suggested there should be a levy for patients who fail to attend more than one appointment without providing sufficient notice to allow the surgery or hospital to offer the slot to others. He claims his, quote, <coughs> transformative shake-up of the NHS will curtail the 15 million appointments wasted each year and that his temporary scheme will help to tackle the COVID backlog, which stands at a whopping 6.6 .6 .6 million. He told The Telegraph if they're, being if they're not being used, that's a waste of if we can cha cha change that, then we basically get more out of the money that we're putting in today. It's a good example of a conservative approach to the problem. Yes, it means we have to do something brave and something different, but that's what I'm about doing. Doctors have previously railed against the idea of fines because they think it could deter patients and would create another level of bureaucracy for our already overstretched health service. But what's your next plan? Be a way to ease NHS pressure. I mean, you know, I'm very tough on lots of Sunak's policies, Carol Malone. Mm. But I have to be honest with you, I completely agree with him on this one. Oh, I think it should go farther. I think it should be a 50 quid fine. Mm. You know, every missed GP appointment costs £30. It costs the NHS £288 million a year. Missed hospital appointments cost a billion pounds a year. Uh, so I would completely... You know, it's, it's the height of bad manners not to cancel yeah. an appointment. You know, we have to pay for missed appointments with physiotherapists, with dentists, if we don't give 24 hours notice. And you know what? You show up. The, yeah. You show up, Stanley, but because the... you know the cost. And this is the problem. Yeah, it's great the NHS is free at the point of use, but it means a lot of folk don't have a value on it. Well, I pose this very question because you gave me an advance notice. I happen to have lunch today in London with uh, a doctor. She is actually the mother-in-law of one of my daughters. <laughs> complicated, complicated thing. But she has served as a doctor for 45 years in yeah. quite a deprived area in Brent. What does in, she think? Brent. Well, what she thought was as follows. She said, well, actually, I understood where Sunak was coming from, but she said from her point of view, she warns them, and if they still don't come, you can actually take them off your, yeah, off your list. Yeah, I, I heard, that, I, was I heard that too. That was a thought. That was a thought. Yeah, but then you can just go around other doctors, but, local doctor surgeries. But isn't the problem is that if you get things free, standing, which, which we get doctor's appointments free, you don't value them. No. You don't value the doc... And, and there are a lot of people clamouring to get a, a GP's appointment and they can't get it. Yeah. And if people willfully I mean, don't turn up, find them. I don't think we should get anything free. It's like when I had one of those Nando's black cards. Have you ever heard of these? Nando's what? I've got <laughs> the greatest one. Do you? Oh, God, that would be <laughs> dead. So I had this Nando's black card. Now, this is a thing. It's a What's real thing. Saying? I don't know if they do it anymore. But you get free... You, you would get free Nando's. You could have it three times a day if you wanted. I could have hundreds and hundreds of pounds of free Nando's. Do you know what, Carol? It meant nothing to me. It meant nothing to me because it was... Oh, are you seriously comparing your Nando's. Nando's? So much more. And I value it so much more. Now that I no longer have this card, they took it away because I think I used it too I much. thought Nando's... Well, you're like... You're, he's the nightmare at the all-you-can-eat buffet, isn't he? I mean, to be he honest... He just goes I, and eats yes. it all. Greg's, Greg's gave me a VIP card and, you know, suddenly I was sort of knee-deep in sausage rolls. So maybe I didn't value that as much either. Cheese and onion pasta. But, but you understand the point that I make here. When it comes to this, I, I mean, I see, where, I see where Rishi Sunak is coming from. I think it's a bit inappropriate to try and blame regular folk for the massive backlog of appointments that we have when they well, fail, way of when they the fail to train enough GPs and doctors and bring enough into the country to meet the demand that we have. And that's a long, a medium-term problem that we failed on. Well, now, don't we actually have the backlog? Let's just be honest about it, because the National Health Service, for a period of time in 2020, was turned into National COVID Service. That's why we have the backlog. I mean, a quarter of GPs are planning to leave the service because they feel overworked and unhappy oh, with please. the quality of life. Yeah, you can say that, but I I can say it's that. It's their choice, and so we have a problem about why they feel so unhappy working as NHS GPs. Because now, they I think, think they I should th be working nine to five. So what's it? wrong with this fine? 
Well, because the truth is that you're going to have lots of people for whom, whether it's a tenner or certainly 50 quid, you know, that's an astronomical amount of money. A lot of people so in this country... So make a phone call and cancel Especially it. in this six months coming. Well, this is my point. They don't have a tenner or 50 quid to spare. And I fear that, you know, they're <laughs> yeah, not they going to cancel so the appointment. cancel your appointment. But they're not going to cancel the appointment. But, they're they not going, the appointment. but they're not... this country doesn't have £30 to spare on every, lo every wasted appointment. But they're not going to book the appointment in the first place because let's say they're raising kids. They've got a poorly partner. They can you know, make they're a gonna, phone they're call. They're going to be nervous that if they miss it because life gets in the way, well, then they're going to be fine money. That means they can't feed their kids. And I don't think you're that's the, a good you, path you're to the go down. Yeah. You're the opposite you, of that. But, yeah, the interesting but, thing from my... But you know what was interesting? I heard a discussion about this today and, and somebody was saying, set up a help, like a phone line, because it's very hard to get through to some GP surgery. It's impossible. And, 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 and actually, put, you know, you, you just put your national really? health number on things. I can't make the appointment. It's three o'clock exactly. today. Exactly, it would have to be done on and, and that would work out. What interests me about this whole thing is we're not hearing from either of the candidates the kind of language we heard from David Cameron. I was like, the national health is safe in our hands. I think, I think that people are, are, are ducking, are ducking, and they shouldn't... No-one not... will attack the National Health Service, Dan. It's a sacred cow. And we well, have to start paying for things on the National Health Service. Sacred that's what sacred I mean. Cows, that's but, what I'm getting uh, at. But it is. It's, it's... No, it is. Do you know what? This was one of the only things I agreed with in the Sunak campaign because, to me, this is brave. But it yes, is a brave can I, yes, it's true. And I it's hope Truss actually true. looks at it. And, the the and real it. problem with Rishi Sunak saying this is that he's just clutching at anything. Yes. Yeah, it is. Well, I mean, his policies, it's be honest, sorry. are going to become more wacky and wild yeah, carry but, over the next But they few all years. are as well. Liz Truss is coming yeah, up but, with some but at least things Truss too. And her team have a thought in the back of her head, which is, holy crap, we're actually probably going to have to do this. Sunak and his team at the moment, they think, what the hell can we say? say it's not going to happen. Carol Malone, <laughs> Benjamin Butterworth, Stanley Johnson, do stand by because coming up the crowning moment of the show as we reveal today's greatest Britain in Union jackass. But next, an uncancelled, her heroic whistleblowing helped to shut down the unsafe Tavistock Clinic. Detransitioned activist Kara Bell reveals all next. First, though, here's what's coming up in tomorrow's show. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight, as the race to become PM intensifies, 48-hour Cabinet Minister Michelle Donnellan gives her verdict on the candidates and whether she thinks ousting Boris was still the right move for the Tory party. Plus, I'll meet the Brit who dumped his long-term partner for a Ukrainian refugee. And there's opinion galore from Nigel Farage, Commonwealth Games medalist turned women's sports activist Mariama Uchi, and my superstar panel of former Daily Star editor Dawn Neeson, political correspondent John Sargent, and author and journalist Rebecca Reed. That's Dan Morton tonight, Monday to Thursday, from 9 pm till 11 pm on GB News. But it's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top voices speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Following last week's watershed decision by the NHS to shut the controversial Tavistock Clinic, whistleblower Kara Bell, a former patient and victim of the UK's first gender identity clinic for children, can finally know that her horrific ordeal has not been in vain. In a high-profile and tragic story, Tavistock initially prescribed Kara puberty blockers at the age of 16, and by 20, she had undergone surgery to remove her breasts. However, following these life-changing medical procedures, Kara changed her mind over her decision to transition to male. Stepping up as a whistleblower, she took her place to the High Court in a bid to stop other kids repeating her mistake. And thanks to the courage of activists like Kara, a report last week exposed the clinic for being, quote, not safe and stated that other mental health issues were overshadowed when children raised the issue of gender. Her dedication to the cause was celebrated by high-profile opponents of the extremist trans lobby, including former Tory leadership contender Kemi Badenoch, who was Equalities Minister when the Tavistock report was commissioned. Recalling her meeting with Kara in a column for the Sunday Times at the weekend, she wrote, To my surprise, I was advised strongly and repeatedly by civil servants in the department that it would be inappropriate to speak to her. I overruled the advice. Along with other advisers across government, I met Kira and listened to what she had to say. Her testimony was harrowing and brought many on the Zoom call to tears. And Kira joins me now. Kira, first of all, thank you for speaking up. Because of you, hopefully, we are witnessing the beginning of a meaningful change. So much to unpack here, Kira, but I just wanted to get you to react first to what Kemi Badenoch had to say at the weekend. Did you have any idea 
that her officials had tried to stop her from talking to you. And do you feel that that is just part of the problem, given what you went through? Yeah, um, I mean, I wasn't aware of it uh, specifically, uh, but I'm not surprised uh, to find that out uh, one bit. Um, yeah, it, it, it does come with the territory, and I'm, I'm sure she was aware of that. And tell me about the meeting that she described, Kira. How difficult was that for you to open up to the officials about what you went through? Yeah, it's, it's always difficult to have to run through it. Um, but uh, they were they were very attentive, uh, which was uh, I was appreciative of. So. so, do you feel like you've made a difference now? I think so. Yeah, I think putting a face to it um, has really made people realise, and I've said before that it's it's not an abstract issue. These are these are people's lives, and they're being affected uh, permanently. So, um, yeah, I, I was just glad I was able to express myself. How were you told? that the Tavistock was going to close down? Were you given any sort of advance warning? No, no. Um, I usually find, find the news out like uh, everybody else does. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was elated to, to find that out, um, but uh, I, I, I am remaining cautious about the whole thing. And Kira, for folk who don't know the details of your story, can you just talk a little bit about the lack of scrutiny you feel the Tavistock gave to your mental health when they prescribed you with the puberty blockers and when they eventually recommended you go through with the surgery? Yeah, so I had four appointments before I was, uh, or I was prescribed on the fourth appointment. Uh, so you had three uh, sorry, appointments? I was referred, yeah, I was referred on my fourth appointment. Uh, for puberty blockers and um yeah the the whole time it was just very superficial um yeah there was no no psychoanalysis or anything like that i mean that is just so shocking to me so shocking to me that you can have three appointments when you were admitting presumably that you were having struggles with your mental health and their answer is to prescribe you at how old at 16 years old 16 years old, puberty blockers. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I mean, looking back now, it's, uh, I, I can't believe it really. And, and this no. is happening to so many more people as well. This isn't just, uh, just a, a freak case or something like that's what people tend to think. So um, this is happening on a large scale since the increase in referrals. And there are statistics to back that up, aren't there? Because the increase in young women in particular who make this decision as a teenager to transition, it's overwhelming. I mean, it, 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 it is part of a bizarre trend, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, social media has a big part to play in it. Um, yeah, it's, it's really just snowballed in the past 10 years and uh, the Tavistock hasn't bothered to find out why that is. They have no data on it whatsoever. So. Um, effectively uncontrolled experiments that have been going on. And of course, for you, you did then, with the encouragement uh, of the doctors, make the decision to have your breasts removed. The physical changes to you, a lot of them cannot be reversed. So I presume the mental torture goes on. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's definitely... Uh, a journey, to, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and I'm doing it all on my own as well. I mean, I never had any aftercare support and uh, still, that's still the same, still the case now. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that won't be easy, but um, I definitely feel like I'm in a better position to deal with things now that I don't have the baggage of, of um, just the, the mental kind of uh, strain that comes with uh, living that, that kind of lifestyle, yeah. And in reality, Kira, what needed to happen in your case? I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but having looked into your story, having spoken to you before and, and spoken to many people in a similar situation to you, what you actually needed was more counselling and more discussion surrounding your sexuality rather than the prescription 
of life-changing puberty blockers rather than surgery to permanently alter your body. That's right, yeah. Um, everything everything that I've, that I've ever dealt with, really. I mean, it all contributed. Um, there was there was definitely the sexuality talk that was missing. Um, just just growing up in my household, um, but and the body issues that came with that. I mean, it, yeah, it was all kind of packaged into one. Uh, you know, I definitely uh, suffered with gender dysphoria, but again, it's it's why why am I dealing with that and and how what's the best way to do it and and uh, medicalizing children definitely shouldn't be allowed and and uh, yeah, it's it's disgraceful. It is. Well, look, you've made a difference, Kara. You've made a real difference here, and and that's not something uh, lots of folk can say. This is something uh, that you will always be able to say that your bravery of speaking up has hopefully protected lots more children in the UK from going through what you've gone through. And we'll, of course, stay in touch with you, Kara, as you go so even much further on this journey. Thank you, Kara Bell. Of course, both sides of the story here on GB News. A spokesperson for the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust said it could not comment on individual cases, but in a statement added, we work with every young person on a case-by-case -case basis with no expectation of what might be the right path for them. We offer support, advice and information and consider possible future pathways together. Only the minority of young people we support across any, access any physical treatment while with us. Time now for today's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass. My superstar panel return, Carol Malone, who's your greatest Briton? Mine is Serena Wigman, the enigmatic, totally unflappable Dutch woman who is the first ever non-British coach of the ladies' team. Under her guidance, the Lionesses, um, we know what they've won, won the Euros, but also they've never lost a game since she took over. This is a girl, when she was a little girl, born in The Hague, she had to cut her hair. She was totally aware of the problems then and wouldn't play for She had to cut her hair to play with the boys because it wasn't allowed in her country. Anyway, look what she did. Benjamin Butterworth, your nominee. Uh, well, the greatest Britain today has to be all of the lionesses that <laughs> won it for England. They did an amazing job and also they brought so much joy. 50 years of waiting and it turned out that what the men couldn't do, the women got done. Yay. And Stanley Johnson. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pin it down. Of course, we're still on the lionesses theme. <laughs> And I'm going to go for Chloe, for Chloe Kelly. And I think everybody was just so 100% thrilled when she scored that goal and then ran around the pitch. I won't describe. <laughs> no, don't. You get in trouble. You get in trouble from the woke mob if you talk about that. Uh, well, look, it's got to be Benjamin Butterworth, doesn't it? And the Lionesses team. <laughs> uh, today's greatest Britain. Union Jack has time now. Carol Malone, your nominee. Mine is all those vile civil servants who try to prevent the former equalities minister, Kemi Badner, we've just been talking about, to, from, they try to persuade her not to close the Tavistock Clinic. They actually said it was doing a perfectly good job when it clearly wasn't. It was feeding puberty blockers to 10 year olds. I mean, yes, How many children's around. lives were damaged by this clinic? Only Benjamin Butterworth, your nominee. Uh, well, mine is the woman who's a week closer to being sacked, Nadine Torres. <laughs> uh, and this week, it's because she tweeted that she retweeted that horrible photo that uh, mocked up Rishi Sunak stabbing Boris Johnson. Look, I know it was a mock-up, but I think given that it probably breaks the rules of the bill she's trying to introduce for the rest of us, it was pretty hypocritical oh, it's, and pretty it's tasteless. It's Caesar, my God, the woke left. You don't, you don't really do satire these days, do you? Uh, Stanley Johnson, your well, union jackass. Well, quick as a flack. I mean, Football Association has done well, but they could have been a little bit more generous and allowed the girls, the women, the lionesses to have that bus tour in London which other winning teams... Yeah, a lot had. of people were disappointed about that today. I, I was really sensing a feeling that maybe there should have been more done for the Lionesses. But I've got to go with Carol Malone uh, here, the civil servants uh, who blocked the Tavistock closure. Uh, Carol Malone, Benjamin Butterworth, Stanley Johnson, what a superstar panel. All friends in the end as well. I'm back again tomorrow night from 9pm. Headliners is up next, though. Good night. Hi there, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. There will be some wet weather around during the next 24 hours, although not necessarily in those areas that have been so dry recently, notably the south and southeast of England. It will also be warm across the UK. The weather coming in from the southwest, it's going to turn increasingly breezy, but also increasingly humid, with areas of cloud now thickening from the west. 
and we've already seen rain pushing into northern parts of the country and that rain will continue overnight heaviest over western hills and a few dribs and drabs of light rain and drizzle reaching south wales and the southwest the midlands as well However, it's going to stay dry in the southeast, and it's a mild night for all 17 or 18 Celsius on the thermometer first thing Tuesday. A lot of cloud, very gloomy across parts of Wales and the southwest, and Scotland as well as Northern Ireland first thing. But the sky is brightened for Scotland and Northern Ireland by the afternoon. Some sunshine comes through. The heaviest of the rain moves through central areas as well. Staying damp across Wales in the southwest, but a brighter skies for the southeast and humid here. 30 Celsius for London, 25 for eastern Scotland, and uh, for all areas, a breeze coming in from the southwest, quite gusty around the northwest of Scotland, where there'll be showers continuing into Tuesday evening. A lot of cloud continues to affect the UK into the early hours of Wednesday, and as a result, it's a notably warm night in places. Central and eastern England, East Wales, temperatures not dipping below 19 Celsius. So perhaps an uncomfortable night for sleeping. And a cloudy start to the day for many. And there'll be some outbreaks of rain pushing into South Wales and southwest England, heavy in places. And it looks like there'll be showers as well for parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. But it turns brighter by the afternoon and Thursday and Friday sees a mixture of bright spells and showers, those showers mostly affecting the north, turning a bit cooler as well. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. 